Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So I just finished up my ED rotation and I think during med school when I did these, I would talk about my experience, what I did, um, some cool things that I've learned and tips that I feel would be helpful for someone coming into an ED rotation. Um, it'd be nice to compare from med school now into residency. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about the difference. If you guys don't understand what's the difference between med student res, um, if you guys don't understand the difference between medical student rotations and residency rotations, you can watch my previous video that I talked about um, why why family medicine residents still do surgery rotations or still do rotations in general. I'll link it up here. One of those. So my ED rotation was a month long. And I remember back in med school, my rotation, during that rotation, my shifts were 12 hours. So I worked from 7 to 7, 7 in the morning to 7 at night, or 7 at night till 7 in the morning. But with this hospital that I work at, it was only 9 hour shifts. So it was either from 6 a.m. till 3 p.m. or like 3 to 12 or, you know, so on and so forth. I had a lot of 6 a.m. shifts and then a couple of 9 p.m. shifts, so 9 p.m. till uh, 6 a.m. in the morning. And then I had a couple of other shifts, but those were the main ones, like 6 o'clock in the morning and then 9 p.m. at night or starting at 6 p.m. at night. Um, it's a lot different working as a resident just because I am doing all the orders, I'm writing all the notes, I'm talking to other physicians about consults. So say a person comes in with chest pain and they have an abnormal EKG finding or something shows up on x-ray or CT and things like that, then I would have to consult a cardiologist and have their opinion on what to do next. Same with abdominal pain and someone comes in for GI, I have to come, GI symptoms, um, do they have perforation or something like that, do I have to consult surgery, um, I have to consult OB a lot, and then if you need a patient admitted, then you would have to consult a hospitalist, so someone to take over for the patient. But I think that's more than you guys need to know. Um, basically how my day went, I would come and sign in, report to my attending, and then I would just pick up patients as they came in. Most of the time they wanted me to pick up the more complicated patients just because I'm a resident now, I can take care of the more complicated things, I can put in orders and monitor my own patients. Um, I would write my note and note to self, always finish your note at least part of the HMP before you consult because it's bad etiquette. If you don't, I found out the hard way and got in trouble. And I feel that's different as a med student because as a med student, you got to do like a lot of procedures. Um, I remember I got to do a lumbar puncture as a, as a medical student. I got to do a lot of suturing. This time I, I did get to do that, those things as well, but I d just didn't have the time. So I would want to do them, but it's just, I have to take care of all these other acutely ill patients and so it takes a lot more brain effort to um, take care of someone who has like chest pain who needs like all these things all these labs done and follow up as compared to doing someone's finger laceration you know so they always usually send the med student to do that stuff um, other procedures that I got to do in the ED, lots of um, paracentesis, people who have cirrhotic livers, the oncotic pressure. Okay, basically this just, um, and just pressure pushing out because there's too much force because you have a cirrhotic liver, which causes you to have ascites. And when that happens, um, we do paracentesis to remove the fluid from the abdomen, basically. I got to do a lot of those. What else? A lot of people came in with threatened abortions or missed abortions or just vaginal bleeding um, or abscesses in that area. So I got to do lots of pelvic exams and speculum exams. So got comfortable with that, which is awesome because now I'm in my OB rotation. So that's that's basically that's basically it. It felt it felt really fun. Um, 
It felt more fun now that I'm a resident just because I had more responsibility and I got to see what it's like to actually be an ED resident. I think the first week I was super overwhelmed because it was so fast paced and you see patient after patient and you're monitoring like four or five patients at a time. But the thing that I didn't like about emergency medicine was that like once you either pass them off to another provider or you send them home, they kind of go off into the abyss and you don't really know what happens to them. Like are their terminal issue, like does that get resolved? Does that get fixed? Like do they survive? Um, do they get better or do they get worse? Like you, you really don't know those things. You kind of just pass it off and then you're on to the next one. Not something you want to do if you need that patient connection, I feel like. So I know a lot of you guys want to go into ED, like you want to be an ED doc. And I was just wondering, why is that? What are some reasons that you guys want to go into ED? Like comment down below because um, I really want to know. The other cool thing is that once you order labs or order imaging, usually it gets done right away. Sometimes it takes really long, like eight hours, but usually that day, by the end of your shift, you should know <laughs> what is going on. Oh, and the also annoying thing that I didn't like about the ED, it's like, yeah, so we worked you up for chest pain um, with like a physical exam, an H and P, and we did labs, we did an EKG, we did um, a CT scan and all these other things. We ruled out all the deadly things. You don't have an MI, you don't have a pulmonary embolism, you don't have an aortic dissection, but unfortunately, we don't know why you're still having this chest pain. <laughs> so follow up with your PCP. So that's when they come to me in the outpatient setting and then I have to figure it out. But yeah, so sometimes in the ED, you don't really know exactly what happens. You just know that they're not gonna die from the serious causes. So some resources that I use during this rotation, let me pull it up on my phone. Um, some, research, some resources that I use during this rotation is Hippocrates. Um, that is an app and I'll link everything in the description box down below um, so you guys can download them if you're interested. But the first one I always use is called Hippocrates and that's just medications and the dosing and how much to dose for each um, diagnosis, basically. Another one that I used a lot was Diagnosisaurus and it was all about differential diagnoses. I'd like to do this um, before I went into a patient room. I would look at what they're here for and then pull up my differential diagnoses so I know how to direct my questions and rule all those things out. Another one that I used fairly often in there was MedCalc and it just basically calculates all the different things. Some of the stuff that I used a lot was like the per criteria and then basically anion gap. There's everything in here. I just used it on OB for Bishop scores. So this, this is really cool. You just have to know which score you're trying to calculate. Actually, let's go through this. Um, some things that I always carried in my pockets, um, and I actually have a box here that I forget to take them out, so I just bring them home. But, like, there's some lidocaine that was left over that's expired now. And then I have alcohol wipe. So I got some sutures, 4 sutures here. Um, you always want to clean or prep the skin and be st as sterile as possible. So I have some betadine here. I always use these big things because if you don't have like betadine or something like that, the best way to cleanse someone is um, flushing over and over again until you see like a bloodless field. I remember every time I did like a finger lack, I would always have to say uh, the wound was examined in a bloodless field, uh, the depth of the wound was explored, no tendon injury, no arthroscopies, and no foreign body. And so yeah, so you always have to write that. And then obviously I have a pen, um, some lubricating jelly. Oh my gosh, so I had to do disimpaction. If you guys don't know what that is, um, don't take opioids because if you do, your poop is just going to like compress into a 
hard ball and it won't come out and you'll be super constipated and over time you just won't be able to poop even after suppositories and so you come to the ED and then they send in the resident to go in there and just basically manually um, like just just scoop it out you know and that's called a disimpaction yeah <laughs> and there's no other way best way to do it you know and so we always tell patients um, try to avoid opiates when possible maintain a high fiber diet drink loads of water otherwise you'll have that solid poop and then the stuff on top will just be diarrhea and just go around and there's really nothing you can do about it until you take that massive um, impaction out. And it was really, it's really sad every time you have to do that because it's painful even when you give someone like um, a relaxant or Ativan or whatever, it's, it's still painful and most of the people who come in with that are people who are chronic opioids or people who like little old lady or little old men who like don't move much and so they get impacted. Um, so yeah, that was the sadder part of the rotation. Uh, what else do I have in here? I have lots of little syringes that I um, use like these. I like to use the smaller ones because my hands are small and usually you don't use that much lidocaine or lidocaine with epi and you can always redraw if you need to. Um, so I had a really good time during the rotation. I was considering maybe possibly doing a fellowship after my residency. One, either um, high risk OBGYN or emergency medicine. But I've heard that so several of my co-residents who graduated last year are working in the ED and they didn't do fellowships. So I'm wondering if I actually need to or it just depends on the place because the, re the physicians who are hired at my hospital are FM trained with ED fellowships. Um, I know for sure if you want to do C-sections you have to do a high-risk OB fellowship. But at the same time, not a lot of hospitals will allow a FM doc to deliver babies in the OR. So it's just a lot to think about. I think it just depends on location. I love where I am right now. And so I, I just don't know. <laughs> when you get older, you, you consider lifestyle a lot. And um, the ED lifestyle is nice just because when you're on, you're on, and when you're off, you're off. But at the same time, I don't think I can do it just because I need to know, like, what happens to my patients. Like, I get so attached. I'm just like, you're my patient. I need to follow you. I need to take care of you. And it's just, I don't get that gratification as a physician when I don't have those things. So... Yeah, let me know in the comment section what you guys want to do, what specialty you guys want to go into, and why. I love to read all those things. Um, if you guys have any questions, please leave it in the comment section below. If you haven't already, please subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. <gasps> there he is! Oh, you're helping daddy? Oh no, I'm probably getting called into the hospital. Hello? Yes, yes, this is me. I put that in. I d oh, okay. I'll go back in.